Hello, this is Ahona. Greetings from Bangladesh Institute of Peace and Security Studies. BIPS and Dhaka Tribune hosts a roundtable every month on a contemporary and strategic issue. We have successfully organized four roundtables so far, and in this fifth installment, we are discussing the strategic significance of the Bay of Bengal and the role of Bangladesh. And we have a distinguished set of speakers to talk about it. I'd like to request our president, Major General Munir Zaman, to state his opening remarks and moderate the rest of the session. Thank you. Thank you, Ahuna, and a very good afternoon to all of you, distinguished participants, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, and assalamu alaikum to all of you. This is a series of roundtables that we are hosting together with the Dhaka Tribune, and we address key strategic and security issues every month. Uh, this month's focus is on the, in, on the Bay of Bengal, its strategic significance, and the role of Bangladesh. This is a topic which is of very pertinent interest to Bangladesh and the countries in the region and beyond. Located on the northeastern part of the Indian Ocean, the Bay of Bengal today is central to international politics, economy, and strategy. In his very famous book, The Monsoon, written by Robert de Kaplan, he argued that the Indian Ocean region is on its way to becoming the nexus of world power and conflict in the future. And that indicates the significance not only of the IOR or the Indian Ocean region, but also the Bay of Bengal. The Bay of Bengal today is one of the busiest shipping routes and lanes with over 50,000 ships passing the area every year. It is a repository of vast amount of marine resources and holds the key to the energy security and resources of the region. It is also one of the largest water body in the world. Being the largest bay in the world, it covers 839,000 square miles with countries like Bangladesh, India, Myanmar, Sri Lanka bordering the bay. It sits between two key political and economic regions of SARC and ASEAN, and also onward connecting to the Middle East and its oil resources. It has increasingly become the focus of rising powers, in particular India and China, and also the focus of external powers like United States, the UK, Japan, and many others. It has seen of late large presence of international military and maritime resources coming to the region. Therefore, it's a place that needs attention of all strategic thinkers and anybody working with the security policy of the region. Unfortunately, neither the IOR nor the Bay of Bengal has a security infrastructure. So that makes the region even more volatile because of the lack of the existing security infrastructure is a, is a playground for any power or most powers. Historically, India has treated the Indian Ocean on the Bay of Bengal as its backwater. But that is increasingly being contested by other powers. I see in the strategic writings coming out of Beijing that China says that Indian Ocean is not India's ocean. So therefore, it's a water which is being increasingly contested by rising powers and existing powers. We are at a juncture in Bangladesh where Bangladesh sits in a strategic location at a key entry point of the Bay of Bengal. We are a major maritime nation. We can play a critical role not only in the Bay of Bengal, but in the whole Indian Ocean littoral area. 
we are a member of ROA. We are a member of all other track one, track two processes in the IOR. So Bangladesh is now becoming a key strategic player in the Indonesian region and also in the Bay of Bengal. We can, in fact, become a key security player and a net provider of security in the Bay of Bengal. The Bay also holds large amount of mineral resources, economic resources, that can come to the aid of not only Bangladesh, but the countries in the region. These are key issues under discussion here today on the table, and some of these issues should be addressed by our excellent panel this afternoon. As usual for our all participants, you know that our panelists will give their opening remarks after which we go into a discussion with the participants, which is the portion that I enjoy most. So without further ado, we will go back to our panel to give their opening remarks, and we will start with Brigadier Shadul Anam Khan, the former associate editor of the Daily Star. The, the topic, let me repeat, is the strategic significance of the Bay of Bengal the role of Bangladesh. I would rather see it as strategic significance and what is it at stake for Bangladesh? Because unless we actually are aware of what is it at stake, it possibly be, it will be impossible or if not impossible, difficult to determine the position that we should assume in addressing and facing these situations arising out of the developments related to the Bay of Bengal and the Indo-Pacific. Uh, my remit is to discuss on this strategic significance of Bay of Bengal, the Indo-Pacific strategic vis-a-vis -vis the Bay of Bengal, the Belt and Road Initiative and the Bay of Bengal, the Big B and the IORA. It's a very tall order and I shall not attempt to cover all these but perhaps make a very broad brush reference to each of this uh, en passe and perhaps leave it to uh, the distinguished participants uh, to ask questions and uh, 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 during the question answer session uh, and, and perhaps uh, fill in the gaps that perhaps I will leave deliberately uh, because of, 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 of uh, want of time. Bay of Bengal has gained salience in recent times and for good reasons. Uh, um, uh, and, and, let, and let me quote a, quote, a, quote a renowned author in regard to this. He says, and it is uh, Professor Kenneth McPherson uh, on the Bay of Bengal, he says, the region was the home of world's earliest urban civilization and the center of the first sophisticated commercial and maritime activities. The ocean area was a great highway and source of food and raw materials, molding the man and the societies on its shores in a composite homogeneous and ecological uni unit. I'm afraid the homogeneity was lost after the process of decolonization set in. And the unity that existed during the colonial period, even during the ancient times uh, from the Chola period uh, in southern India, the homogeneity was sundered because uh, in the post-colonial era uh, for, some, for some obvious reasons, most of it was nationalism and, 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 and our impulse to protectionism. So what was an integrated region became disintegrated and it was rather, it was known as rather an area of disintegration rather than integration. And just to just sort of compare, uh, Asian, ASEAN has 25% integration in terms of trade and other issues, whereas South Asia has 5% integration. And, and uh, as I said, uh, it was one, Greater India, Burma, and Malaya uh, under, the, under the colonial colonial structure. There was no East Asia, Southeast Asia, or, or, or South Asia. There was one Asia covering, 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 covering this, this area or situated in this region. Uh, <coughs> now, as I said, it has gained salience because of the fact that the focus of the West has turned east 
uh, for again for some compelling reasons post post cold war uh, the, the focus was in the middle east and in the west after the cold war where because of the asian century that one predicted because of the of the of the economic trajectory this this region and the countries led by china japan and india uh, would take the focus was obviously on 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 asia and therefore on indo pacific the term the, the fixation from asia pacific to indo pacific and of course the beyond bengal which is a very important adjunct of the of the of the of the indo pacific and again i quote another uh, erudite scholar in regards to beyond bengal who says the beyond bengal is starting to become whole again and is starting to the center of history no one interested in geopolitics can afford to ignore the bay of bengal any longer there is a new old order center of the world joining the two demographic immense cities of the indian subcontinent and east asia is robert Kap kaplan writing on his critical of bay of bengal what is the economic cloud of the bay of bengal i'll come to the study significance but just a, as a prefatory uh, comments the economic cloud 1.4 billion people reside in this bay bengal area 2.7 trillion combined gdp 5 to 6% growth annually and the bpsr of world economy predicts a 1 trillion cft oil and gas reserve along india bangladesh myanmar coast is immense potential is immense uh, 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 future and look at Bangladesh and the Bay of Bengal, as, as General Munir mentioned, we'll often lose of the fact that Bangladesh is a maritime country. It's a maritime country. 24,000 uh, 24, 24 kilometers square of internal sea and 138,945 kilometers square of EEZ compared. And the, and the land territory uh, or the or the or the uh, the the, the uh, sea territory is 1.1 times 1.5 uh, times larger than the land territory. Compare that. <coughs> Bangladesh located in this center. I wish there was a map of, of of the Bay of Bengal. We are located at the approaches of the Malacca Strait. Something that the China China is very worried about, and Malacca Strait is something that is modulating China's behavior, China's policies, China's actions. Uh, and China's strategic postures uh, as the Malacca State. I'll come to that eventually. The only seaport that is near the landlocked Indian Seven Sisters, Chittagong. More than 32 million people live in the coastal zone of the Bay of Bengal, Bangladesh. And 4 million people are directly involved in sea fishing uh, with the trawlers, mechanical, and country boats. 92 per, 90 percent of GNP depends on the sea trade, Bangladesh in Bangladesh, uh, and, and come, almost 100 percent of Bangladesh's energy requirement in terms of fuel comes through the sea from the Middle East. So you can imagine the immense dependence of Bangladesh uh, on, on, on the sea. Now come to the strategic significance of, of, of the Bay of Bengal. It is the most important part of the Indo-Pacific hemmed by India and Thailand, and just like the points, it oversees major trade routes, uh, two major trade routes, and it connects the two largest oceans. So Bay of Bengal is an economic connector. It connects South Asia and Southeast Asia. Uh, uh, as I said, there was no South and South Asia at one time. It connects the region with the major oil resources in the Middle East occupies the heart of the Indo-Pacific. It is something like the South China Sea, an important South China Sea, and say, so juxtaposed South China Sea and, 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 and the Bay of Bengal. And it's, it's proximate to two future big powers, the China and India. And the largest economies, militaries, and population, these two countries, uh, which are destined to lead, as I said, the Pacific Asian century. This has become and will become the prime zone of economic competition. I'll come to that later on. Again, the focus has shifted for a couple of uh, relevant reasons. One is India is looking uh, to the southeast, 
waking up to the importance to the Southeast, which started in 1990 with Nashima Rao looking East, and later on uh, with Modi acting East. The focus of India has shifted to the to Southeast Asia, and India is one foot. Of India's 1.2 billion people live along the coast of Bay of Bengal. One fourth of its 1.2 billion people, a humongous number. And therefore, if India is worried about 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 other powers in the Bay of Bengal, perhaps it is not too unjustified to feel to feel worried, because it would also like to leverage its position in the Bay of Bengal and maintain peace and stability and derive the benefits, strategic benefits and economic benefits that accrues from being where it is geopolitically. Obviously, because of the importance of the of, of Beyond Bengal, it has invited external powers. Well, Beyond Bengal, to be very frank, China is not a resident power, neither is the US. But these two countries are more interested than any, any other countries, again, for their strategic reasons in the Bay of Bengal. And when I say Bay of Bengal, uh, I, I, I mean interminglingly uh, or, or sort of fungibly Bay of Bengal and Indo-Pacific because Bay of Bengal opens to the Indo-Pacific on either side. So the US, Japan, Australia, Singapore, Korea, Malaysia all recognize the Bay of Bengal's importance. <clears throat> it's also been motivated by China's very proactive diplomacy which America prefers to call this predatory economics. <clears throat> and China's use of smart power. Let us come to the Indo-Pacific strategy vis-a-vis -vis the Bay of Bengal. In fact, the Indo-Pacific strategy and Bay of Bengal and China's BRI are all intermixed. And, and, and just, just cast back the time of the formulation or the enunciation of, of, of the BRI policy by, 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 by Xi Jinping, the articulation of Look East by Obama and Hillary Clinton, they're about the same, the timeline, 2012-13-2014. The Look East policy of Obama and Clinton, uh, uh, which then sort of mutated uh, into Indo-Pacific in policy, and of course, the China's Belt and Road, but perhaps happened almost simultaneously. So, which was generated by which is for you to sort of, sort of, sort of, sort out. But it all happened simultaneously. But one perhaps motivated the other. One perhaps generated the, the other, because it is it is said that because of China's BRI, because of China's um, MSR, because of China's enlarged footprint into not only South Asia, Southeast Asia, but beyond into Africa and in, 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 in Europe, <coughs> the Americans felt that it had to be countered with the policy, which eventuated as the Indo-Pacific policy, and now the build better policy. Isn't it, if I'm correct, the build better policy, the American policy of build better. Build back better. Huh? Build back better, yeah. Yeah, that's right. So the Indo-Pacific policy is no longer nebulous. It is very concrete. And America is willing uh, to deploy all power and force to ensure that the FIAP, the free and open Indo-Pacific, is not, is not, is not, don't bother, don't bother, don't bother. Is not, is not, is not, is not, is not hampered. And it, its insistence on the rule-based international order. Uh, you, you, see the, you see the example of rule-based international order, what is happening in Ukraine. A good example of rule based international order. I mean, I'm, be, I'm being a bit facetious in saying that, but, and I know the location of my tongue in relation to my cheek when I say that <laughs> there is nothing as a rule based international order in this world. And I, I hope some, this issue will come up of, 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 of Ukraine and, and the, and the invasion of Ukraine. Now come to the, uh, to the BRI. As I said, BRI, MSR, and the, the, and, and the Indo Pacific. It are all interlinked and they are, they are the sort of inter, 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 interwoven. China's BRI, more investment. If there is more investment, and of course, then there will be more employment of resources to protect the investment. And sometimes, and not more often, the investment is in terms of military uh, uh, assets. 
but more importantly, the Bay of Bengal, uh, uh, China sees this as, as, as a panacea for this Malacca dilemma. Because 80% of Chinese uh, oil passes through Malacca. Nilfar, you can, Lalafur, you can correct me if I'm wrong. 80%, 70 to 80%. 80%. 80%. 80%. It is correct. It is correct. Uh, so, 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 so uh, China wants to sort of circumvent this problem, and the only way to do that is to find other routes. Uh, and 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 what better than the Kaikyu port? Yeah, uh, Chakpu, Chakpu, Pakpu. If it's Kiati starts, so Kaikyu must be Chakpu. Whatever it is. So, so, so the port the, and 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 of course the the, the China Pakistan economic corridor and the China uh, Myanmar economic and all the sorts of economic corridors, and of course Chinese uh, Chinese sort of uh, sort of uh, uh, the prevalent thought of uh, in the mind of Chinese planet is infrastructure, 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 because you build infrastructure, you link people, you connect. And once you connect, you become interdependent. Once you become interdependent, the chances of conflict are lessened. Hopefully, hopefully. But perhaps I would cast your mind to the fact that the that the Indian positions, the American positions, eventually that sort of uh, uh, mutated into 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 the triad, the AUKUS, uh, uh, is because of Chinese Chinese expansion, naval expansion. Uh, although China is there to catch another 50 to 60 years by the time it catches up militarily, China, if, if, if ever, uh, the naval expansion. But look at the mindset of the Chinese Chinese leaders. In 2012, in the 18th Party Congress, Hu Jintao articulated the need to safeguard maritime rights and interests, need to safeguard maritime rights and interests. Six years later, Xi Jinping articulated the need for a powerful navy. And a year later, he said, in a defense white paper, not he, but the a strong and powerful navy capable of carrying out mission on the far seas. You see the gradual incremental development of philosophy, of strategic philosophy, from safeguarding our coastlines to projecting power. So now we know that China has, he doesn't have the ability to project power in the way other countries have, developed countries, but it has the intention. So if you have the intention, uh, you, you, it is acquiring the capabilities. Intention change, you have to gain the capabilities to implement the intentions. So, so I'm just flagging this point for you to, 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 to call me back here, sir. One minute, 60 seconds? You will come back again. I'll come back again. Okay, the, uh, the, the Bay of Bengal or the Big B, the Big B you know, the Bay of Bengal, the, 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 the industrial growth belt with Japan. Uh, has 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 uh, uh, come into uh, an agreement with Bangladesh involving five billion dollars, and it is to gain the to to sort of offset or counter uh, whatever we wish to call uh, Chinese sort of uh, influence in a way partly by 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 involving involving uh, in Bangladesh, and that was uh, sort of a part of the economics 2014 when. Ebe Shantur Ebe visited Bangladesh, signed the deal. And its, it's, order, it's, its intention was sort of to leverage Bangladesh's central location, centrality in the Bay of Bengal uh, in development projects, primarily connectivity uh, <coughs> and, 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 and deep sea, de deep sea de uh, develop, development. We'll come to that later on. The IORA, again, uh, did not tell you that it was the brainchild of of the famous man of the 20th century, uh, Nelson Mandela, and I quote when he said, the natural urge of facts, of the facts of history and geography should broaden itself to include the concept of an Indian Ocean Dream for socio-economic cooperation and other possible endeavors. Recent changes in the national system demand that the country of the Indian Ocean shall become a single platform. Nelson Mandela, 1995. And eventually 23 members become a part of IOR, which then members uh, of the states. Again, uh, the IOR uh, uh, terms of reference, the BIMSTEC terms of reference, and other sub terms of reference, they overlap. They are the same. Blue economy, cooperation, connectivity, uh, 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 and of course, the climate change. Uh, um, so the interests overlap. And if you sort of look at the test, you'll find there are three main uh, sort of issues 
that uh, that 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 prevail on the minds of the of the, of the planners of the participants. Cooperation, connectivity, economic development, the blue economy, make use of the blue economy, and sort of sort of the maritime awareness. There is some called maritime awareness. There's some called the the, the area awareness uh, that that the countries need to do. So, so in short, gentlemen, in, ladies and gentlemen, it's a very broad brush. I'm sorry for the for the way I had to rush, but these four things that perhaps would have would have underlined the, the growing importance of the beyond Bengal and the need for Bangladesh. Uh, the consequence of the importance, the consequence of the big players' role, the consequence of demand of the big players, which causes countries like us, Bangladesh, to be sandwiched between big powers and the need for countries like us to modulate our foreign policy in a manner which will eventually utilize the benefits of such of these groupings without getting into any overt or covert military uh, alliances. Uh, and on that note, uh, I would like to, I would like to end, uh, hoping that we'd be able to sort of indulge in, in further discussions in the question answer session. Thank you very much for your very elaborate explanation of the issues related to strategy of the area. A point that we must remember from the presentation that the Bay of Bengal has tremendous demographic relevance. A quarter of the global population lives along the shores of the countries that border the Bay of Bengal. 400 million people live in the catchment area of the Bay of Bengal alone. So these are large demographic relevance. But what worries us in Bangladesh as a literal country, as a member country of the Bay, is the rapid militarization of the maritime space. In the absence of a security architecture, several powers are entering the Bay with military motives and, and missions and aims. We today have some major naval exercises taking place in the Bay and in the IOR. For example, the, the Malabar series of exercises happen every year, participated by the United States, Japan, India, and this year by Australia. We also have, for the first time, about three months back, the Chinese Navy, the Russian Navy, and the Iranian Navy carrying out a naval exercise in the IOR. We have the Milan series of exercise initiated by India where 16 Asian and African navies participate. So the maritime space very close to us is rapidly becoming militarized. We as a literal country of the IOR and a member country of the Bay of Bengal must take the initiative now so that this process of militarization holds. We want a Bay of Bengal, which is a zone of peace. We are the current chair of IRA, and this is a good time for Bangladesh to float some of the strategic concepts and ideas. So as we talk about these issues, the previous speaker has also mentioned about what is being called the Malacca Dalama. So the Malacca Dalama really worries some countries in the region, particularly China. China today is also worried about the close proximity of Andaman Nicobar and its assets, both naval and air, being able to reach the Malacca Straits. So there is a double strategic worry on the part of China that needs to be addressed. China is also rapidly reaching the Bay of Bengal through the BRI and also to the projected BCIM. The BCIM has been currently stalled for some time, but the BRI corridor is progressing. The CMEC China Myanmar economic corridor has already been completed. So therefore, China is already able to reach the Bay of Bengal and the Indian Ocean to Yakpu in Rakhine. When the corridor progresses to Bangladesh, it will be able to enter the Bay of Bengal and the Indian Ocean area through Chittagong. So it will have 
double entries into the Bay of Bengal and into the Indian Ocean region. So major powers are racing to reach the Bay and then onward to the Indian Ocean. These are issues that we must understand now and take note of. And to address these issues, I couldn't find a better speaker than to give us his explanation. And that will be Rear Admiral Kazi Sobra Hussain, uh, Bangladesh's former ambassador to the Maldives and the former DG of the Bangladesh Coast Guard. Admiral, you have the floor. Uh, I would like to thank Brigadier Shahidul Anam also, sir, because you laid down a very uh, good path for me to progress. I guess um, some of the things that I take cue from uh, the socio-economic and the political integration that you talked about that converged in the Bay of Bengal. So having taken cue from that, I, what I intend to do is to examine, re-examine of course, how geostrategic underpinnings have overshadowed or to some extent overtaken, if you will, the politico-economic construct and the aspirations of the literals of the Bay of Bengal. I realize there would be some repetition, uh, some information would be repetitive, but those will be in context. Towards the end, if I have time, if the chairman allow me some time, I want to talk about the climatic change aspect and the ecology of the Bay of Bengal, very briefly. But if there are any issue that uh, we, uh, we are pressing us, we can always discuss during the uh, interactive sessions. The um, strategic significance of Bay of Bengal actually are anchored on three principal coordinates. These are firstly the maritime connectivity that connects the uh, regions through the maritime space, trade and commerce that are undertaken along the, show, uh, along the Bay of Bengal and connecting connected choke points and also the uh, critical infrastructures that have been built by the regional uh, countries and also the extra regional powers that are likely to be used for dual purpose, military uh, for uh, firstly for the commercial purpose and also for the military purpose uh, to s in times of crisis. So uh, the connectivity issue, I will very briefly uh, talk about uh, just to, uh, you know, connectivity issue is mainly connecting the two of the greatest oceans of the Indian Ocean and Pacific Oceans, which have added tremendous geostrategic value to the Bay of Bengal, as uh, Brigadier Shahid already talked about. Bay of Bengal is seen as the economic highway of the world. And a staggering amount of 50,000 merchant ships traverse through Bay of Bengal carrying one quarter of the commodity that are traded in the world. The Bay of Bengal is also important for the energy trade route that it hosts between the Gulf countries and the, uh, the, uh, so, uh, the East Asia, which goes through the Strait of Malacca. As far as the trade and commerce is concerned, the maritime trade and commerce is concerned, we have to understand the, uh, the rapid industrialization and development of the East Asian countries, especially China becoming the manufacturing center of the world. Now, to support these industrial development and manufacture, the raw materials that comes goes through Bay of Bengal. And also the uh, Malacca Strait is used extensively by the China and the Far East Asian countries for transportation of these uh, goods that goes to East Asia. We heard about the Malacca Dilemma. Uh, if I have time, I'll talk about this in some detail. As far as the critical maritime infrastructures are concerned, there are a number, number of critical maritime infrastructure that have come up along the coast of Bay of Bengal, which has added tension to the strategic construct of the Bay of Bengal. 
few of them, few among those would be like Yakpu port, which has been uh, built on the coast of Myanmar by India, correction by China. And the China is aspiring to open a second coast along the Bay of Bengal, connecting the Rakhine province with the southern eastern province of Yunnan uh, uh, in China. So they also have a, a, a well and pipeline from Yakpu to the uh, Yunnan province, which is likely to export 6% of the, uh, the energy uh, inputs that China receives every year. On the contrary, India has built, uh, is contemplating to open up a Kaladan multimodal project from the port of Sitwe in Myanmar. Now, there is a strategic significance of these uh, Kaladan multimodal project, all, uh, which has different dimensions. Number one, the, uh, this would provide India with a direct access to the, his no northeastern states, which, does, which are landlocked at this point of time. And also, it would be, uh, India would be able to bypass Bangladesh, should it be necessary at some point of time. So, Kaladan multimodal plot project would give India the staying power and the endurance to undertake commercial and military operation at the same time. Then there are uh, Hamban Tota in Sri Lanka, which we have heard about. We all know, but there are a lot of controversy mired in this uh, uh, Hamban Tota uh, seaport. But then that also has, has the has potential to be used for dual purpose. There are uh, speculation that the Chinese Navy submarines could be uh, operating from the uh, Hambantota uh, seaports in times of crisis. Lastly, I want to talk very briefly about Matarbari deep seaport, which is uh, the main deep seaport of one of the deep seaport of Bangladesh coming into uh, operation soon. It is already operating at some uh, uh, some degree of uh, operational operationalization, but it would come into full force soon. Matarbari would be a deep sea port which would offer Bangladesh an enormous opportunity to open up its trade, not with the littorals of the Bay of Bengal, but also with the uh, uh, other regions of the world. Now these significance that we discussed not only bestowed the Bay of Bengal, the commercial opportunities and also economic success, but it also brought a lot of tensions and confrontation within the uh, regional countries and also within the extra regional powers. Adding a sense of fluidness, com complexity to the strategic construct. The, the strategic con construct of the, to understand the strategic con construct of the Bay of Bengal, I believe we need to understand the push and pull factors that lead to the, uh, the uh, existence of this crisis and tensions and also confrontation. The push and pull factors would be convergence of the interest of extra regional powers, number one. Number two would be maritime power projection. And number two, three would be the increased militarization of the region. In the recent years, geoeconomic and geostrategic interest of some of the extra regional powers are converging towards the Bay of Bengal. They recognize the tremendous potential that the region has due to its enormous demographic capability and strength and the value of strategic goods that transit through these Bay of Bengal. China is, is a key player which we have already heard about, but China's energy geometry in Bay of Bengal, especially her Malacca dilemma, has posed a strategic challenge for China to conduct her trade and development activities. China's quest for Bay of Bengal has two factors attached to it. One is to maintain the uh, commercial passage and trade corridor to the Gulf state and beyond. And, and on the other hand, to 
support its ambition to emerge as a re reckonable global power. India's strategy in Bay of Bengal so far developed on three axes. One is to counter potential threats from China and its military presence in the immediate neighborhood. Secondly, to strengthen the military partnership with its friends and partners to balance China. Thirdly, to emulate Beijing's quest for foreign military presence and maritime power projection. Because of the historical mistrust between India and China, these two nuclear powered neighbors view Bay of Bengal as a crucial frontier for competition over energy resources and securing sea lanes of communication. Delhi is particularly concerned about the BRI initiative and the number of ports and outposts that have been created by China along the coast of Bay of Bengal, especially the, the, the ports and other facilities which have been operated by and built by the Chinese state-owned companies which can be act as an outpost of China in times of crisis. Another important regional, extra-regional power, United States, has a lot of stake in uh, Bay of Bengal also. Their strategy revolves around two factors. Firstly, to maintain Bay of Bengal as a secure highway for international commerce between the Gulf reach. Gulf uh, states and an economically dynamic East Asia. Secondly, to maintain freedom of navigation through the strategic choke points of the Strait of Malacca and the South China Sea. Other actors like Japan and Australia are also taking keen interest in Bay of Bengal affairs, where the main objective of Japanese <coughs> involvement is to remain active in the economic front but both Japan and uh, Australia are member of quadrilateral security dialogue and have aspirations to operate in the Bay of Bengal region. Japan for herself is working on a secret project to extend the range of sound operated surveillance system over the shores of Andaman and Nicobar Islands, apparently to detect the submarine transiting through the Bay of Bengal. This is a, this is a very high value and very highly technical uh, uh, surveillance system, which Japan is contemplating to uh, extend up to Andaman Island, uh, Andaman, shores of Andamans. Australia is also allocating substantial amount of resources to its Navy to be able to extend its reach, reach to the to the waters of Bay of Bengal. The growing geostrategic rivalry in the Bay of Bengal between the regional and extra-regional uh, powers have given rise to increased military activities. Indian military, uh, military maritime strategy in consonance with the United States Asia Pacific rebalancing strategy explicitly articulated the strategy of concerted action to contain the rise of China. The core of this strategy revolves around the initiative to formulate a security alliance and bluster economic cooperation and create multilateral format of capable maritime forces. According to Maritime Capability Perspective Plan of India for 2007 to 2022, India plans to acquire more than 160 ships with 40 major combatants and 400 aircrafts. It also has a plan to put together a fleet of 28 conventional and few nuclear powered submarines in the Navy. India has been building its military power in the Bay of Bengal, including naval and air facilities in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, potentially to dominate the 
western end of Malacca Strait and surrounding waters. Indian Navy is also gradually upgrading the facilities of the Eastern Naval Command, which is located at Vizag, Vizagapatnam, with fleet, ships, and submarines. At the region level, at the region level, Indian Navy has increased its naval cooperation with other littoral countries, including Myanmar, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka. Indian Navy supplied a submarine to Myanmar last year and transferred a number of naval hardwares to the littoral navies. Indian Navy regularly organizes naval exercises and drills with the navies, not only of the littorals of Bay of Bengal, but also of the other regions. Exercise Mil Milan, as our uh, chairman just talked about, is a flagship initiative of Indian Navy to increase its naval preparedness and also to show her maritime presence in and around Bay of Bengal. The Chinese policymakers, on the other hand, see a strong navy not only as a force for national defense, but an instrument of expanding and sustaining its economic presence in the area. Given this strategic atmosphere, Beijing's primary military goal is to transform the People's Liberation Navy into a blue water force capable of projecting force outside the China's near abroad and also in the Bay of Bengal area. As of last year's report, Chinese Navy has the largest naval fleet in the world with 355 combat ships, including two aircraft carrier. It is assessed that the number could reach 420 by 2025 and 460 by 2030. They also operate a fleet of sophisticated submarines in the range of number of 70, uh, 70 submarines with seven ballistic missile carrying submarine and 12 nuclear powered submarines. Of late, Chinese submarines and survey vessels have increased their routine visits in the surrounding waters of the Bay of Bengal. On 24 December 2021, Chinese Navy transferred a Ming class submar submarine to Myanmar. Myanmar. Ming class submarines has also been transferred to Bangladesh Navy by China in 2016. She also transferred surface ships, weaponry, equipment, and armament regularly to Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Myanmar, or either on grant or on loan. United States, United States also has increased its naval presence in the Bay. The US Navy aircraft carrier recently visited the Bay of Bengal and, con and the greater Indian Ocean area and engaged in a planned exercise on two occasions. In, during, in the last year. We can see that this, uh, this militariz uh, militarization of the Bay of Bengal has added tension in the geopolitical arena in the Bay of Bengal. Therefore, it is uh, uh, for us to formulate a comprehensive strategy to use these rivalries and chart our course, course of action so as to give the maximum benefit out of this confrontation and use it as a leverage to advance our own interest. I have a minute, sir. I have a minute. I want to talk about the uh, uh, climate change uh, uh, issues just for a very briefly. I was asked by the chairman to talk about climate change. But uh, before that, I just want to tell you that I have I have personal interest on the marine biodiversity of Bay of Bengal because I was a diver in the Navy. So having experienced the, uh, the, the physical chemistry of the ocean and the sea by being there, I would just like to take a minute to talk about the uh, climate change issue in, uh, in the Bay of Bengal. Bay of Bengal is experiencing a host of adverse climate change phenomena 
in the last 45 years sea surface temperature in bay of bengal has risen by 0.2 degree celsius to 0.3 degree celsius and is projected to rise by 2 degree celsius to 3 degree celsius by the end of this century now because of these ri rise of temperature the bay of bengal sea level rise is, sea level is expected to rise by 37 cm by 2050 and by meter by 2100 that is 2100 you can understand a 3 foot rise in the sea level would submerge majority of the co uh, outlying coastal coastal area of the littorals of bay of bengal as for us bangladesh we estimate that about 20% of bangladesh would be underwater by 2100 causing a displacement of 30 million people as a climate refugee because of these uh, advance uh, the change the change of temperature especially the rising temperature the, the uh, there would also be variation in the uh, occurrence of tropical revolving storm and cyclones Bay is already witnessing uh, increased frequency and intensity of tropical cyclone in the last two decades. Of the 35, for your uh, reference, of the 35 deadliest tropical cyclone that happened in the world, 24 have occurred in Bay of Bengal. The Global Climate uh, Risk Index 2020 shows that intense cyclone, excessive rainfall and severe floods would ad adversely affect the literals of the Bay of Bengal causing loss of lives and also inducing climate refugee. Flood and drought has also increased over the years in the Bay of Bengal which would pose growing threat to crop, plant and animal. Increasing sea temperature and CO2 abs absorption in the Bay of Bengal would be leading to ocean acidification causing Vulnerability to the fish species, especially we have already seen in the Bay of Bengal extinct, extinction of some of the species of, uh, of the fish at the sea and also depletion of coral, uh, coral uh, plantation. The, because of the acidification, there will be depletion of coral. In our own St. Martin's Island, we already have substantial amount of depletion of coral because of climate change and uh, also the human induced intervention as for my uh, i can tell you uh, i would add, finish it by telling one of my experience of this uh, uh, the coral uh, depletion in the bay in this st martin's island we are under the auspices of the navy we are undertaking a project to uh, to uh, kind of you know look after the the, the depletion of coral and also plant new coral in the uh, in the uh, the coral reef so as to restore to its uh, present form i would uh, i would end up my talk here and uh, i would welcome any uh, discuss any queries and clarifications during the inter interactive sessions thank you sir Admiral, that was a very detailed explanation of the security landscape and the maritime security of the area you touched on some very key issues a particular interest to us would be to start with the Kaladan Multimodal Highway. I would ask all our participants, please have a look at the plan of the Kaladan Multimodal Highway because it is something very close to Bangladesh. It starts at Sitwe, it reaches the Indian Northeast, and perhaps it is an alternative to the loss of Shiligori Corridor in case of an emergency. I would also like to point out that I said in my last intervention that CMEC has been constructed. So therefore the Chinese are already at Yakpu port. The Admiral mentioned about the pipeline going back to Yunnan, but it is not only a pipeline. Yakpu is going to become Chinese major energy hub. It is a place where they can perhaps bypass the dilemma of the Balaka Straits. There's going to be an oil refinery. There's going to be a gas drop zone. 
So it is going to be a multimodal energy hub for the Chinese, dropping all the energy that is being piped back to Yunnan. So therefore, the Yakpu port is not only important in terms of economy and trade, it will be a major energy hub for the region and for the Chinese, and all, we'll also have perhaps dual use capacity. I'd also like to say that AUKUS is also bringing new connotations to the Bay because the Chinese have expressed their concern that with the capacity of the Australian Navy increasing, perhaps this area will also come under focus. As the navies of India and certainly of China aspires to graduate from a brown water navy to a blue water navy, much of the region is coming under focus. And therefore, we as a Bay country are coming to the center of the whole game either intentionally or unintentionally. So therefore, it is important for us to understand all the connotations, all the developments that are taking place. The Indian Ocean region strategy extends to the Bay of Bengal. So therefore, when we talk about the strategy implications of the Bay of Bengal, in many ways, it is an extension of the Indian Ocean strategic implications and has also the implications coming out of the South China Sea and the rivalry going on there. So there is a, this is a very complex mix of international players coming into the fore. We did not mention about Russia, but the Russians and the Russian Navy has also shown interest in the Indian Ocean region and in the Bay of Bengal. So we practically have all major players who have shown interest and are now becoming active players in the Indian Ocean region with an active focus on the Bay of Bengal. We have monitored that major crisscrossings of major navies have taken place in the region, also in the Bay. There has been freedom of navigation, fleets, movement of the 7th Fleet of the US Navy that came within the very close range of the Indian bases, and it was strongly protested by the Indian government of the Indian Navy, although it is the right of the US Navy to carry out freedom of navigation within the limits that they were carrying out. It is legitimate, it's legal. So therefore, we have not only interests of other navies in the area, we are now seeing bringing up of new legal issues coming to the fore. An issue that is close to my heart as somebody who has been working on climate change security issues for many years, as the chair of the Global Council on Climate Change and the Military Council, I know the Bay of Bengal has become the most vulnerable maritime space in terms of impacts of climate change. And that's an issue we'll address again towards the end. But I would like to say that the Bay of Bengal is not only strategically important, militarily important, it is economically extremely important, both in terms of trade and economy, in terms of geoenergy, in terms of the resources that lie there. So therefore, we would like to address these key issues. And our next speaker on the panel, Professor Pervez Karim Abbasi from the Department of Economics of East West University, is the right person to give us this analysis. Professor, give the floor. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, uh, General Muni, sir. I almost feel like Bangladesh because after following a veteran army man, a veteran navy man, here I am an ordinary civilian. There's a lot of conversation about India, a lot of conversation about USA and China. What was telling was the absence of Bangladesh in Bay of Bengal, a place which is intrinsically related to Bangladesh. So again, I'll be very focusing on very mundane issues. Won't be very exciting, but I'll try to make it worth your while. So, so, so I have 10 minutes. The first two minutes will come up with an historical lesson with, uh, uh, with basically some wisdom which we would like to follow. Number two is 
we'll be looking into the geo energy of Bay of Bengal. And especially, mind you, we're talking about Bangladesh's perspective. And last but not the least, we'll be talking about certain geoeconomic aspects, because it's a vast, vast literature, geoeconomic aspects of uh, resource exploitation and possible resource extraction for Bangladesh within the framework, conceptual framework of blue economy. Last but not the least, if we have time, we'll be looking into a uh, way forward. So this is the structure. Already one minute is gone. Now, one of the tragedies of Bangladesh is, though it's a maritime nation, it is, we are almost uh, consigned to a fa fate of land lovers. What is land lovers? Those who love to live on land. So despite having conspicuous advantage of such an extended coastline, and also with our victories in terms of maritime delimitation, we have not been able to utilize the advantages that has been offered to us. It pains us to say that even Myanmar has beaten us in taking advantage of the potential of the Bay of Bengal. And for Bangladesh, what is worrisome is that even during the times of Shaista Khan, the legendary governor of Mongol, uh, Mughal Empire, who reclaimed Chittagong from the Mokyu Kingdom of Arakan, he had to rely on Dutch privateers and Portuguese renegade pirates to reconquer Chittagong. And least we forget, the one moment when the British East India Company came in, it didn't come with a lot of men. It came on the strength of his maritime prowess. The moment we lost our security on the ocean lanes was the moment where the most prosperous kingdom in India lost its freedom. And all this discussion on geoeconomics, blue economy means nothing, ladies and gentlemen, until and unless we develop a very capable modern navy. I believe the government is already investing in this, but navy which can take advantage or which can enforce our concepts of blue economy. Before that, nothing is all of this is, again, good to talk in the seminar room, but that's about it. That's the historical lesson. The second one is the geoenergy of Bay of Bengal. Now, over here, we hear a lot of concepts about blue growth, blue economy, blue growth, and so on and so forth. So what is blue growth? Well, this is a long-term strategy to support sustainable growth. We economists love sustainable in everything. Sustainable growth in maritime sector as a, as a whole. And this is commensurate with the Sustainable Development Goals 14, the uh, various number of components over here. And when you are focusing on maritime growth, you're including aquaculture, coastal tourism, marine biotechnology, seabed mining, amongst many other things. And so proper resource management becomes vital. Now, when we talk about our energy requirements, 63% of, of our energy requirements are met by natural gas. And where does Bay of Bengal come in? Bay of Bengal has three particular well-defined basins. The Krishna Godavari Basin in India, the Rakhine Basin in Myanmar, and most importantly, the Bengal Basin of Bangladesh. And in terms of resource endowment, the, the Bengal Basin of Bangladesh is the second most resourceful, according to geological survey. But it is the least exploited. If we talk about hydrocarbon exploration, because in this age of energy crisis, that is what Bangladesh requires most, we have basically carried out 20 exploratory wells we've drilled. Only two has been successful, and you know about this. One is the Sangu Reserves, and another one is basically the Kutub Diawan. Sangu Reserves is only 0.8 trillion cubic feet of hydrocarbon deposits, and Kutub Diawan has 0.04. Uh, trillion cubic feet. The Sangu reserves is almost depleted. The other two, not, it is not economically extractable yet. That is the scope of this. Whereas only less than 1% of a natural gas supply comes from offshore exploration. So this is a big gap for us. Whereas if you look at Myanmar, it has recently discovered four trillion cubic feet of gas in the Mahar region or Mahar oil wells within the Rakhine Basin. Now, why am I mentioning Myanmar and Bangladesh? 
You got it. Because in 2016, gas was discovered in Thalin 1A well. What is that Thalin 1A well? Now, this is in Myanmar's block, AD7. These are the designations that you have. But block 87 is adjacent to our deep sea block 12. So what does that mean? There's a concept called fugitive resource capture because gas is amorphous. When you keep on extracting and there's no maritime delimitation. So when you, if, I, if I'm not extracting my gas in my block and another country keeps on uh, exploring gas in the adjacent block, Gas, because if there's a vacuum, gas will continue to come, almost like the Kuwait-Iraq syndrome. So it is in our own interests that we must go for robust deep sea mining and deep sea hydrocarbon exploration. And that again, basically brings us to the role of Petro Bangla. Petro Bangla and BAPEX, right? Now they have basically divided our share of Bay of Bengal into basically 26 blocks. Over there, we have carried out 2D and 3D seismic surveys. And over here also, some of the blocks have been leased out. Two to Indian companies, ONCG and Oil Company of India, and two more, to one to the British company, Santos Chris Energy, and another one to Posco Devo, which is again a South Korean conglomerate. But none have yet to ex basically yield significant amount of hydrocarbon deposits. So, but this is the point where the government has also stepped in because over here, the Bangladesh Maritime Zone Act has come in whereby it wants to conserve and also better manage maritime resources. But again, a lot of work needs to be done over here. There's also a need for capacity building within BAPEX because that is our basically instrument or arm for which basically which deals with contract negotiations. Now, when we talk about renewable energy, the coastal belt that we have, we can use this, but for this, we're reliant on technology transfer. So do the, whether we match up with the Chinese or the Dutch or the Australians who have significant expertise in this remains to be explored in the future. Now, that takes us to the blue economy part. I'm rushing a bit, but I will hope we'll have some time later. The blue economy, this is what I call the color revolution, minus the political implications. Because once upon a time, there was brown economy, industrial production. Then we talked about green economy, with all due respect to the environment lovers. That means sustainable development. And then nowadays we have come up with blue economy. God knows what else economy will come up with. But again, it was popularized by Gontor Pauli. And over here, this idea, and this is basically an old concept of ocean economy, which is wedded to the concept of blue economy. Now, basically, in very simple layman's terms, it's sustainable use of ocean resources for economic grow growth, improved livelihood, greater number of jobs, and ensuring ocean ecosystems' health. And of course, there's focus on fishery, aquaculture, food security, tourism, shipping, maritime transport, biotechnology, and medical technology. Now, again, these are things that you know. But now we are going to focus on what can Bangladesh achieve in the next 10, 20 years? And who do we need to partner up with? Now, for example, the first thing is comes over here is shipping. Already it has been touched over here because in 2017-18, 3,000 foreign ships in one year came to Bangladesh because we have at least $80 billion of trade if you bring in import and export, roughly. And as of 2018, Bangladesh has only 42 registered ships. The numbers might have gone up slightly. And in the next 10 years, your freight volume is projected to grow by $435 billion. Bangladesh doesn't even capture 10% of this. Until and unless we develop our indigenous shipping industry, already steps are in, and we cannot, we cannot basically go for value addition. The government has already undertaken steps, but public-private partnership viability gap funding is required. And this is where we can tie up with other countries who have had a lot of expertise. Australia is coming in strongly in Asia. United Kingdom is a giant who doesn't know what its power is. It is lost to his American cousins. And then again, with India, 
we are always worried that whenever we bring in India, the Chinese will mind, and whenever the Chinese are in, the Indians will mind. So they're goodbye Bimstek, just like Sark. Now, if we come back to this from shipping industry, we go into the coastal shipping or the feeder services, medium types of medium sized services for basically national shipping or for medium distance shipping. Even in case of feeding uh, services, 94% of our trade is conducted through maritime ports, but we have only two. And again, the congestion and this has already been, we, it's, it's common story. We are building another one. We are building another one in Mathabadi and the one on Pyra, God knows. But the idea is we have to increase our handling and birth capacities in Chittagong. That requires time and that requires investment. And that also requires which country is politically acceptable to invest. Do we bring in the Japanese? Do we open the Chinese? Even the Russians have expressed interest in investing in a deep sea port in Ishwati. Fair memory serves me right. But post-Ukraine crisis, is it acceptable? See, Bangladesh as a small country has to juggle with a lot of things. Apart from this, apart from this, see, we're talking about big ships and coastal ships, but there are also other things. Do you know that there are 300 shipyards and workshops in Bangladesh? And it does the little stuff, like inland vessels, fast petrol boats, dredging barges, passenger vehicles. Now, all of those things we require to expand capacity because backward supply linkages. Ship recycling, now that is growing in a massive manner and it yields $2.4 billion in revenue for Bangladeshis. And most of the furniture that we have, the boilers that we have, that comes from the shipbuilding industry, recycling industry. But over there, ensuring better health of the workers, better basically uh, ensuring that toxic chemicals are not uh, are actually regulated. That is important. I come to the last three minutes of this. Now we come to a more important thing. There's a saying in Bangla, Mache Bhate Bangali. That means a Bengali is known by his, uh, by his preference for fish in his cuisine. Well, on land, we have 250 species of fishes. In, the, in our EEZ, we have 475 species of fish. 337 species of snails and other crustaceans and several kinds of lobsters. But how many can we actually exploit? I'm giving you the numbers. 70,000 artisanal mechanized and non-mechanized wooden boats and only 250 industrial steel boats. That is the number that we have for our fishing industry. And already there are questions of the Myanmaris or the Chinese boats or the Vietnamese coming in and exploiting this. So again, Navy's expanded capacity must be invested so that we can protect this. Piracy, big problem. And again, the Navy's capacity is expand, expanded, but we do require to invest significant amount of resources apart from lip services. No, I'm not angling for a lecture at BIMRAD. If people think that way, I'm basically hunting up to the Navy. But the, the, the next question is, and when you go for deep sea fishing, the maximum that we can catch is 40 meters. But most of the, where the goods lie is below 50 meters. So deep sea fishing is actually not taking place in Bangladesh. So those capacity needs to be installed. Ve vehicle tracking and monitoring system or vessel tracking and monitoring system and GPS coordination, Bongobundu satellite, we need to link this up. Already steps are being taken in, but again, we need to look into this. And now the most important part of the, uh, program or my speech, mineral resources. And what is it for? Now, over here, several things that we have ignored sea salt. The entire belt from Teknaf all the way over here to, Pat to Patai, or, or from Teknaf onwards, it could be a hub of sea salt extraction. Thailand makes several million tons of uh, sea salt. We don't. This is small scale farming is done, but it should be given an industrial basin. And then we come up to a beach material. And there's a 250 kilometer coastal belt that we have from Potenga to Teknaf, which can be used for this. If you talk about the beach material, the beach uh, that is found again in the, on, our, on our seashores, what are the things that we have? Zircon, rutile, 
mintine, garnet, and all along with this molybdenum, manganese, copper, lead, zinc sulfide, and monazite. Let me just tell you the uses of it, and then I'll finish this. Now, if we talk about monazite, it is found, do you know what monazite is? I, even I didn't know this until I did my research. It is used in atomic bombs and nuclear reactors in significant quantities in Bay of Bengal. It is a strategic mineral, and not according to my word, Atomic Energy Commission of Bangladesh. And if you talk about manganese, phosphorus, polymetallic sulfide, these are used to refine rare earth metals. The world is of the rare earth metals, but you need to refine them for your microchips and semiconductors. We have this in Bangladesh, but we need, and we can also extract this economically, but we need the resources and transfer of technology. And along with this, we have even more interesting, uranium and thorium. And we don't need to tell you what uranium and thorium is required for, but we need money for research. We need money for capacity building. We need money for technology transfer. We need time for capacity building. And Bangladesh is already on this way, because if you talk about Delta Plan 2100, it has already factored in the concepts of blue economy. And there's also an oceanographic research institute that's opened in Cox's Bazar. And there's a blue economic cell that's opened in 2014. And it is also, even in terms of sand, which is used for construction, we can extract 1 million metric tons of sand, which is vital for construction. Now, summing it up, what does this mean? Bangladesh has started the maritime race late, but that doesn't mean it has to always remain behind because it is of great shame we talk of Bay of Bengal. We hear India, we hear China, we hear USA. We even hear about basically, even in the Indian Ocean Realm, we hear about Sri Lanka. But what about the nation of early mariners who originated from Bengal? So this is a challenge that we must explore in the 21st century. Thank you. Professor, well, thank you very much for that excellent presentation. Uh, we will now open the floor and let me give you some house rules. Please be, be very brief in asking your question or making a comment. We are speaking here on the record because all our recordings will be placed in YouTube channels of both Tribune and BIPS. We are also publishing together with Dhaka Tribune a two-page supplement after the event. So everything is being recorded and will be placed either on the newspaper or the YouTube channel. So the floor is open. Please ask your questions and make a comment. Please indicate to me if you want to ask a question and want to get the floor. Let me just have briefly scan the room and see how many hands do I see? Bring it again, sir, you have the floor. Thank you, Chairman. I could see the economic, economic aspect and prospect of Bangladesh business in the ocean has been adequately covered. I have been one of the director of military operations for a long time, a later an ambassador for about 13 years. I have some observation on something like uh, economic aspect, one is very important aspect of a country that make a country robust or uh, have strength to speak up. We have a strong neighbors, but I heard some of the details about their military, uh, military arsenal, etc. But it has been over, uh, what you are over stressed on that, in that issue here. A lot of people say 17 or 90 ships and all have been there in India, being in ride with their Navy. And they are not that strong. I don't know, he may disagree with me, Admiral. Uh, we have a lot of advantage in this Indian Ocean. If, he, if I'm wrong, he may correct me. First of all, no big ship can enter within 150 kilometers of Bangladesh. But, uh, nautical miles, yes, nautical miles, because because our uh, continental shelf is very far away, you have to come up to 150 after they cannot enter. During our liberation war, 
American ship came and they got stuck 150 50 nautical miles away. And they couldn't get in. They wanted to, you know, help Pakistan. They couldn't. So we should be too much of our, <coughs> optimistic about Indian Navy and all. And uh, they are still have old time ships. Most of the ships they bought from British or British Navy, used it, modified it. That's how they continue. So it's not that effective things. We have, what about, we may, may have to go for different strategies. Particularly I'm talking about our defense, uh, not that uh, economic, economic aspect of it. The Indian, when they shot, they sank one of the submarines of Pakistan, they used their Torpedo, small, what you call, uh, boats, fast moving boats, fast moving boats. Two of them they went and went straight, fast moving. They shot and that uh, sank that, what is called? INS Gazi. INS, no, not Gazi, another one. PNS Gazi, yes, that's right. And uh, that's what we, we had to we think of in our in defense also what defense strategy we need to protect our country because it's a, ours is every dimension that is a resourceful country. Bangladesh being those small, it has a lot of importance in all respect. Our neighbors are there. Then now the interest of China has come in in big way for Bangladesh. You have seen that um, BLI and all these things. Uh, this is creating a lot of movement and China is banking up on to really develop it. I had an article, they had a, last time they had a big magazine where a lot of people wrote. I had also an article on this and nobody can stop it. They even want India to be with them and India is going to be with them. So this aspect we have to look into in details. Our resources to be used best way and as you have said, hundreds of ships are coming to Chiragong, which government is trying to develop. Then. Uh, the one other in the pipe, what is it, on the other side, new one they're being building. This is also a great aspect of our future. So, about our neighbors, sometimes we are over, always try to, you know, highlight their things that were this and that. You must have seen what when China came in, came in they beat them up into the water and hundreds of people to get, got killed. So they are not that capable, I can tell you, but our defense must be thought of. Otherwise we will get dictation from our neighbors, they will tell what to do, what not to do. Uh, I won't say much about it, this is what I have to say here. Yeah. Thank you. Zahir, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to make some remarks, uh, and then also make some observations, and thereafter give a proposition really and then uh, ask for response from the speakers. I have an antithesis, really. Uh, uh, if we see the strategic significance of uh, Bay of Bengal, it reduced significantly after the British left. Uh, and as I remember, that the first time big American visit to this area was after the cyclone of 1970 and thereafter the great cyclone of uh, 1989 when their battleship Tarwa, the task force visited uh, this area. I was at that time in Chittagong and the Americans even didn't have the latest uh, maps of this area. So, so you can understand that what you are talking about, the significance of Bad Bengal. Yes, the southern Bad Bengal was sig always significant. But the northern Bad Bengal, I think the significance of northern Bad Bengal is very distant. And it's, it's, it, it has become in the spotlight. It's because of two aspects. The Myanmar, China-Myanmar corridor and access to the Bay. And also to some extent because of this Kaladan Valley project of India. So, but 
Bangladesh has always been marginalized in the greater, uh, what I will say, that uh, construct of security and also uh, value that Bangladesh really deserved. But if we see that uh, Bengal is the sea of three countries, this is the sea of uh, Bangladesh, it is also the sea of India, and it is the sea of Myanmar. But it is also outlet for Nepal, it is also outlet for Bhutan, and now it is also a significant outlet for China because of the Malacca dilemma they are facing. So that is a reality. The Malacca dilemma is compels China to have a corridor and access to the Indian Ocean, and so this is an outlet. And this, because of this reason, the entry of China and the presence of China, that has really heightened the significance of the northern, uh, what I would say, Bay of Bengal. But we should not forget, for Bangladesh, Bay of Bengal is the lifeline. For Bangladesh is the lifeline. All others have other exits. India has other exits. Myanmar has other exits. Well, Bangladesh, this is the only exit to the oceans. And that's, that's why any geopolitical rivalry in this ocean, your bay, and also if you're connecting the Indian Ocean, Bangladesh will be the greatest sufferer. And, and, and this we should, Bangladesh, remember. And just to say about Admiral Sarwar's um, last bit of this environmental side, I think it, is an, it has been an oversight, he's an expert on this, but I think Bay of Bengal has turned into one of the most polluted sea now. And, and if this level of pollution continues, then marine lives will vanish. And, 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 and I'm sure he wanted to highlight this, and he will highlight on this also if he get the chance. So that's why I want to make this few comments and make this proposition. Because of this, I think uh, Bangladesh should moot a proposal, a concept of making Bengal a geopolitically neutral sea. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a Kantian concept. But I said it's, 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 it's a Bangladesh's interest to declare Bay of Bengal and fight for it to be a geopolitically neutral sea, meaning that all the users of this sea, especially the main users, should exist, coexist peacefully and use this sea peacefully. And this is my concept. I would, I would request all the speakers to respond to this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, can I have Mr. Masu from Cosmos Foundation? Thank you so much, uh, uh, General Luis and Uncle, for having me here today. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I, I don't really have a question, but just a few comments I would like to uh, just say, um, in particular about uh, you know exploration of gas in the Bay of Bengal. So. In fact, uh, I, I'm, I'm the deputy managing director of Cosmo Group, and we've been in the oil and gas sector for the last almost 40 years. Uh, so I just wanted to share that, in fact, uh, I had given a presentation at CPEX, which is, stands for Southeast Asian Petroleum Exploration Society in Singapore, and I'd done this uh, before COVID about three years ago, and about almost about 30 international oil companies uh, heads were present there, and I gave a presentation of for Bangladesh. I gave a whole scenario of this our gas uh, sector here in the Bay of Bengal. Uh, you know, the approximately gas reserves and the blocks and all that kind of things, the roadmap. And in fact, uh, one thing I'm happy to uh, share is that now finally uh, we've been able to pursue the Bangladesh government Petro Bangla to upgrade this uh, fiscal policy, you know, to improve this uh, the fiscal policy to attract the international oil companies. The reason why Myanmar next door has been drilling like crazy is because they, they have made it attractive to, to, for their oil companies to come and, and explore. So there has, to, there, has to, there has to be provisions where it is lucrative for the oil companies 
and for Bangladesh, they can export as well. So that is happening now. Uh, just want to share with that. And uh, so I think I think pretty soon we'll see. And also one more thing I would like to point out is that you know in the recent increase of uh, LNG prices, uh, I would also request that our government looks into having a I think more of a balanced uh, you know, portfolio. We can have LNG, we can have renewables, we can have gas. So I think that's also important to look at, um, you know, because also our gas reserves may not may be gone in twenty years' time. So that's also very important to extract at this time. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Uh, next, uh, the floor goes to High Commissioner of Sri Lanka. I'll just um, highlight a few salient features. I'd like to take up what uh, Major General was speaking about the strategic philosophy and also the security architecture. I think fundamentally, I think this is the most critical thing in the Bay of Bengal because sitting in the middle of the Indian Ocean rim, Sri Lanka as an island is facing the heat of this kind of thing. So I think uh, what uh, has been elaborated in Mill General's idea, which has been also spoken about others who are looking at um, looking at the security concerns of Bay of Bengal, if we do not have a recognized and also a, what I call workable strategy for security, that's going to be a huge mess in this oceanic front in the coming years. And uh, both Sri Lanka and Bangladesh are located at the two corners of the Bay of Bengal, and we feel the heat of this. Because the influence and the pressures our countries face, uh, it may not be very visible, but also it could be really a, what I call, um, undermining factor to our countries. Um, we are looking at, um, because this issue, I think we have to go beyond Bay of Bengal, and see how we can synchronize with the Indian Ocean Rim. Uh, I think it was Brewster who was talking about the Indian Ocean Security Forum. Something back. Uh, but unfortunately for the Bay of Bengal, we still have the Tri-Continental Maritime Agreement, which is linked to Sri Lanka, India, and Maldives. Bay of, uh, Bangladesh and Seychelles are observers. I think Bangladesh must come in a big way for this. We are doing one of the starting points we are looking at about the security concerns. Um, we are also looking at the commonality and centrality of the Bay of Bengal. Uh, this kind of everything revolves around this. Uh, because we have recognized the importance and the significance of the Bay of Bengal, but also the commonality of it. How could we reach out? If it's a common ocean, we should also recognize our common heritage. So this heritage is something which we can connect to each other, identify each other's interests, and also uh, have a, what we call a feasible policy uh, recognized by all countries. This. I always thought that this goes beyond the BIMSTEC and the SARC agenda. This has to be taken at a different level altogether because, because we find different areas zoning, because we are doing a fair amount of research in Sri Lanka on Bay of Bengal. We are looking at the zoning of Bay of Bengal. We are looking at the hinterland and the maritime provinces. We are looking at the resources. We are looking at the heritage. We are looking at all the economic systems. We are looking at also the histories of these parts of the country. Because this Bay of Bengal put up some of the most spectacular civilizations in the over 3,000 years. So we have to recognize and take cognizance of what we can take from history. Um, the other important thing is uh, my friend um, who uh, Professor Mark Padres was talking about uh, resources, especially maritime resources, and sorry, mineral resources and the marine resources. Uh, this again something what we have been doing researchers and the research onto this. Uh, I think it's a good thing for our countries to combine our resources. Uh, our research centers, Sri Lanka is also having 
uh, maritime research centers and also uh, uh, institutes for oceanic research centers. Now these things we have been looking at about climate change, especially mineral resources within these areas. So I mean, for instance, what you talk about rutile, we are having a huge export market when we are exporting that part. We are also looking at keeping the coastal line, which is in the coastal areas, how we protect the coastline without over exploiting these resources. Mm -hmm. So this is something what Bangladesh can exploit and also uh, also protect your coastline. Then also, we are Indian Ocean, we have the formation of the geological formations of the, the paid boundaries. Now the paid boundaries run all the way through Indian Ocean, south of Sri Lanka. Uh, actually, there are at least three to four plate boundaries running through Sri Lanka. Now, all these plate boundaries, which is also connecting to Bangladesh, but at a very deep level, they are very rich in mineral resources. So, one must look at these things uh, as much as you have to, what you call, protect the environment, uh, exploit the resources very sensibly, uh, and, and also how we latch on to each other in our research agendas. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. But before uh, you leave the microphone, would you like to give us a status report on Hamad Tota port? Because it came up quite frequently in the discussion now and before. Well, Hamad Tota, you find a lot of news in the Sri Lankan and international media. Hamad Tota was originally, uh, it is operating now as a kind of a, what do you call a, um, it's one of the redistribution centers. And um, at the moment, China is having a section of it where they bring their goods or their transport or they transship those things and the Sri Lankan government op operate in the other sector. Now, unfortunately, Hambantota has been used as a catchword on the, what you call the debt trap of Sri Lanka, or what the Chinese are doing. Um, so, originally, Hambantota was offered to invite China, actually, to come and uh, place its, uh, what you call, infrastructure, and also to work on it. But India did not comply. And then, we were, ju we were just recovering a 30-year-old war. So we had to look at the Chinese and others who are interested in developing this port. And this goes for, we are now having the Colombo port development. It is a massive thing. It is going to be probably one of the central points in the Indian Ocean rim uh, for shipping. And it's taking off very well. And um, I've been telling my Bangladesh colleagues this is a time to invest if you want to invest because Sri Lanka is a very open country. We have even better less affair than the United States. So if you want to invest, this is the time to do it. And um, uh, Port City of Colombo, and it's developing very well. So I think it's, uh, I mean, I'm just cut, talking this place. And the third port is, of course, Trincomalee. This is the old port of during, what was developed during the World War period. It's an old port historically. Uh, we got major oil tanks there. We collect oil and then also redistribute. Uh, and one of the best n natural harbors in the world. Uh, so Sri Lanka, we've been actually just talking about the feeder service, uh, Major General. Uh, the shipping uh, uh, talks are just coming up with Bangladesh. So we have in those two going on. Uh, and we have three ports to service. So Sri Lanka's, what do you call, strategic location for shipping, especially for Bangladesh, is very important. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. The next question, Editor, Defense Journal, Mr. Rusht. Thank you, sir. I uh, just, uh, all things are covered. I just have uh, two or three points. But General Joy sir has told that uh, Bangladesh, Myanmar, and in India are the main stakeholders in the Bay of Bengal region. And Myanmar has created some problem with us. And if you consider the present day situation and the happenings in Ukraine concerning Russia, you know, only three countries, they have openly supported the Russian aggression against uh, Ukraine. 
one is Syria, one is this Myanmar, another one obviously is Belarus. So, so Myanmar is just beside us and is one of the major stakeholders in the Bay of region. So I think in the coming days, this place will have a lot of activities and a lot of alignment because the world alignment is going to be changed. It will dramatically change. Come what uh, it may, it will be changing. Uh, if we think just 10 days back, now the world is different. And it will be different in future. How the things will unfold, you will see. We will also see, we can just predict, but we cannot. We are not sure. It depends on the decision on the Russian Russians. It depends on the decision on the NATO countries. But we are going to have some stakes on that also. Because Myanmar, again I am telling Myanmar, they have created a lot of problems for, for us. We didn't ask for it. Someone dragged us into the problem, Rohingya issue. So this area is going to have some problem in the Bay of Bengal region. Others, you see what is happening in Myanmar, a repressive military junta. Simple. OK, China has built a deep seaport. How is going to, uh, OK, they will uh, take the logistics and other things. Everybody is talking about it. But why are you excluding this thing, which is affecting us, the Bangladeshis, and the other countries of the world? They have imposed a repressive regime in Myanmar and supporting and uh, uh, by uh, United Nations, vetoing against us. And without solving this problem, how we are going to have a safe and secure Bay of Bengal? How this CNET is going to be operative? How this BRI is going to be operative properly connecting Bangladesh? So a lot of things will be there. Insurgencies are growing in Myanmar. So that will be the hotbed for next conflict in this region. I think this should, uh, we should keep in mind also. Thank you. Thank you. We are about to finish. Uh, Ambassador, please, you have the floor. Please be very brief because we're about to finish. Um, my name is Shahid. I worked uh, uh, for long in abroad and in Bangladesh. Uh, the topic today we're discussing the strategic significance of Bay of Bengal and the role of Bangladesh. Uh, well, I'll be very brief because we have we have had a lot of very very useful information from the experts, and I've heard with interest. But I will be I was when we say strategic significance of Bay of Bengal, to my mind. Uh, our good friend India and China, they are the two strong strategic players in this region. And we have to keep, as for the role of Bangladesh, we maintain good relationship with these two countries. Uh, so that is a very important uh, role Bangladesh is playing by balancing its relations with these two important countries in, the, in this area. And uh, well, other, other vessels will ply other resources are there. And, uh, you know, when I started my career, uh, it was uh, related to, I think we had some discussion on the exploration of the Bay of Bengal. And uh, I used to work with a foreign oil company for a short period before I joined uh, the came into the mainstream of the service. Uh, I had the chance to go to the Bay of, uh, to visit the rig and visit the Bay of Bengal. And it is loaded with a serene blue water with plenty of resources, with my very limited knowledge at that time. And since then, I have seen it has uh, moved uh, by leaps and bounds in every area. Uh, where Bangladesh, even at that stage, uh, was very obvious in, in playing its due role. Uh, but I think still, uh, in, in, in the process of last 50 years of our independence, our trade, commerce, our military interest, strategic interest has increased many fold. So we need to gear it up, think very seriously how we can uh, jointly work uh, without disturbing. And I think the Sri Lankan High Commissioner also gave, gave us some new brilliant ideas that uh, we can have some good strategic partnership with, with, with a number of countries uh, who can come forward and bring a better relationship and understanding and the role of Bangladesh will enhance. Well, these are my observations. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Ambassador. We now go back to our panel members. The panelists may take about a minute or a minute and a half to give you a very summary of responses. We'll go in the reverse order. So, Pervis, you have the floor. I'll be very, very brief because one or only one or two questions were tangentially, tangentially addressed at me. Number one, yes, the Sri Lankan High Commissioner is quite right 
because there can be further technological collaboration with Sri Lanka, though we Bangladeshis and Sri Lankans tend to like each other more than any other part of the world, but somehow the degree of economic and again trade and technology transfer that's supposed to take place between Bangladesh and Sri Lanka somehow has fizzled off after the post sark era, if you know what I mean. Number two, if you're talking about, again, there was some uh, very interesting observation. Oh, yes. Again, uh, again uh, I'm well aware of Cosmos Foundation and Night Uncle is, again, uh, very active in this. Yes, we cannot expect investment in Bangladesh, and especially foreign direct investment, without generous assurances and policy continuity. Today, one regime gives one, one particular company an offer, and then, God forbid, that regime changes. All of a sudden, we find glaring holes in that contract. And then we, by, we, we, will, we are saying that we will get all the investment in the world. Nobody is going to come and invest in this country if there is no policy continuity. If we disown our predecessor's work, there's nothing going to work. Ease of doing business, if it doesn't improve, nobody is going to come and invest in this country. Even if Myanmar is a dystopian junta run place, people are going to invest over there because businessmen are after profit. Let's get off our ideal high horses. And last but not the least, why do we say Myanmar's only friend is Russia? Russia is also our very good friend. Rupal nuclear power plant. A military, uh, they're also our fourth largest development partner, $1.4 billion. The Russians are smart, at least in our case, thank God. Bangladesh is on its way up. Myanmar is on its way down. Even a fool can say so. I think that the Russians can invest over there. And again, we only give uh, we only give Myanmar a bad name that the Chinese support them. Uh, but the Indians are as passionate in their support for the Myanmar junta, if not more. Somehow, in case of Myanmar, we become the step siblings. We have to find our own allies. Yes, and this is also true. And what you did not say, but reading between the lines. If we have to realize our potential of Bay of Bengal, either things have to uh, be resolved with Myanmar or things have to deteriorate significantly in Myanmar so that our maritime assets can come into play. What happens? Only time will tell. Thank you. Uh, let me uh, clarify a few points that have been brought out uh, by some of the uh, participants. About the larger ship coming to 150 miles of Bangladesh, uh, if it was a wash, if you are talking about a warship, uh, aircraft carrier, now there are two dimensions to this. One is the aircraft carrier doesn't have, you know, for the aircraft carrier to come and operate, doesn't have to come very close to the shore. Number one, because it has, it has an uh, stand up distance, it can operate. So it, it's not, uh, I mean, it doesn't have to become so close. Number one, and number two is the. Um, there was an aircraft carrier which operated uh, close to the coast of Bay of Bengal in the in our war of uh, liberation in 1971. Ilis uh, Vikram, Ilis Vikram came and operated off Cox's Bazar. So it, this is uh, the, this is clarification that I wanted to uh, talk about. The other clarification that I wanted to uh, about the the security mechanism and the security organizations in the in the Bay of Bengal established security mechanism or cons construct absence of the security mechanism. Now, uh, if you, let's talk about BIMSTEC. BIMSTEC has few agendas which deals with climate change and also uh, illegal migration. Now, if you talk the, about the, uh, the non-traditional maritime security uh, spectrum, the uh, illegal migration through maritime uh, space and also the climate climate induced disasters are also part of the non-traditional security uh, uh, agenda. Non-traditional security, uh, the threats that we have in the in the Bay of Bengal. So the uh, BIMSTEC has two charter on this. So this is a kind of uh, make and shift I mean, uh, of security mechanism that we have. Number three is the, there is an organization, there is an uh, arrangement called IONS, Indian Ocean Naval Symposium which is an enclave of the uh, the the naval uh, uh, naval personnel for the, ex ex the navy chiefs of the indian ocean uh, navies who sit together and discuss about the security issues and uh, suggest their various uh, modalities that can be undertaken now in the ions bay of bengal is represented uh, as a uh, as 
you know, very strongly in the in considering the, the countries, the, the lace, the Bay of Bengal, Bangladesh, India, Sri Lanka, and also Myanmar. So that is another mechan uh, mechanism that is in place for the uh, for looking after some of the security issues of the Bay of Bengal. Now I'm come back, coming back to the, um, I just want to substantiate some of the comments uh, made by uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Parvis Karimabasi about the strengthening of the Navy. I understand, I, I'm, not in, I'm not going to advocate for strength, strengthening the Navy because from being in the Navy. But what I want to uh, you know, submit is the increasing the maritime domain awareness among all the stakeholders that are involved in the, in the business of maritime affairs. It is not only the Navy, not only the Coast Guard, also all the agencies, those go out to sea and operate and also the, who regulate various activities in the maritime affairs should put their act together in an integrated and concerted manner so as to raise the maritime domain awareness among the not only among the practitioner but also among the entire population of the country we when we, we talk about see we talk about only cox's bazar and pothenga the entire population you know need to go beyond cox's bazar beyond pothenga and see the uh, see the prospect see the resources that we have in the sea and how this best can be best you know utilized for the national interest. Last point about, uh, the, I again want to substantiate uh, General Jahid's uh, talk about the pollution. Uh, I'll just be very, very brief, sir. There are three agents, uh, three, uh, uh, you know, issues of sea pollution that is really hazard, hazarding the Bangladesh's economic and also security prospect. Number one is the plastic, uh, uh, non-degradable plastic, uh, you know, uh, pollution at sea and is um, you know, no, is you know proliferation at an unprecedented rate in the Bay of Bengal. Number two is the uh, emergence of a dead zone. There is a dead zone. There, uh, the the German and the Indian scientists have come up with a dead zone. Uh, you know, a dead zone has been found out in the Bay of Bengal, which is about sixty square kilometer dead zone. And the dead zone is bereft of oxygen. There is not much oxygen supply in those dead zones. As a result, most of these sea species would probably die out very soon. So it's this is known as the black hole of the Bay of Bengal. Yes, sir. It is known as the black hole of the Bay of Bengal. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for uh, commenting. So that these dead zones, uh, you know, are also you know are hazardous for uh, for Bang for the prospect of Bay of Bengal, especially in fisheries and marine biodiversity. Number three is the ship's recycling plant, which uh, we just uh, heard from Professor Abbasi. Now, ship recycling also create enormous amount of pollution. Enormous, because the, because of two reasons. One, you know, uh, it's, it's a profit-driven industry, and uh, there is no uh, <coughs> concern about the health and the pollution uh, issues. Number two is there are not enough regulatory framework set up by our government and concerned ministries to regulate the pollutions, uh, pollution that takes place in the sea. Especially even the maritime shipping ordinance that we had was uh, probably corrected in 1983, just way back. You know, it did not have provisions for pollution. So these are some of the regulatory uh, framework that we need immediately to arrest pollution in the, in the Bay of Bengal. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Three points. The first is the one that you made about uh, in your remarks, uh, security structure. Or the, I think that's a very interesting point to make. Uh, I think we need to have a separate uh, roundtable on this. I forum one is very respectable, uh, very, 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 very about uh, an idea of, uh, of of a common security structure for the in the Bay of Bengal for a host of reasons. Uh, about our, uh, our, our long continental set. Don't fly into rhapsody with this idea of long continental If our ships can, uh, our frigates can use <laughs> the, the, and, and come in and berth in the, in, 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 in our area, yeah, uh, then, 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 then uh, it's, it's, it's immaterial. In any case, today modern ships uh, lay on the standard of distance. 
and, and that is why the, the platforms are moving, the platform is static, static. So I think this is, this is the point. Uh, well, it's just a point, uh, John has read about, uh, about uh, zone of peace. You remember Zofpan? It rings a bell? Yes. What happened to Zofpan? Zone of peace, freedom and neutrality, signed in uh, what, 74 by the seven uh, ASEAN nations. Every single, every single ASEAN country now has its, has, has its own dynamics with, with big powers. And the, 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 the Singapore has their own equation with China, so has, uh, so has, uh, 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 Indonesia, uh, so is Malaysia. So therefore, the men, the men, the men, the undertone of 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 of, of Zofpan has been defeat, defeated long ago. So I think it's, it's, it's again a, a very very holy thought of of a of a neutral area of a neutral. It 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 it, it is it, it sounds very nice. Would like to have a zone of peace, freedom, neutrality, but then the reality is different. I think you know. Well, like, so far as use of it. No. Well, use use of the because because you know the no. big big powers. We have our interests. Big yes. big we have our interests, but big powers find in the world uh, as as the administrator said, in, uh, their interests are coterminal in so far as this Bay of Bengal is concerned. So therefore, uh, and, and their policies. So therefore, it is it is as far as Myanmar is concerned, policies. Who are the main backers of of, of Myanmar? Who have consistently uh, vetoed? All, 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 all uh, even, even motions in the Security Council in general. Who are our three good friends? India, Russia, and China. So beat your, beat your head and 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 and, and, and cry over the, uh, as much as you want to and cry horse uh, till kingdom come. Things, realities, realities. There are practical realities. Real politics. There are real politics. You see. So. Myanmar has a greater strategic importance to Russia and China than Bangladesh. Let us accept it. Let us accept it. It is the truth. You cannot provide anything like Kaladan to India. You cannot provide the port like, like, like to China. So therefore, why will they? Vito, why will they? And, 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 and so far as, 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 as the, the, the Rakhine is concerned, that state is rich in Myanmar. And that will be denuded of all, all the population. Not only Muslims, but all the local populations, you know that, so that a special zone is made for the Chinese. So these are real politics, they are able to live with it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We have come to the end of the discussion, which has been extremely rich and wonderful analysis of this critical maritime space has been made by our experts and also participants. I would not like to summarize the discussion, but I would only like to end with some food for thought what Bangladesh can do. Bangladesh, unfortunately, even as a key maritime member of the Bay of Bengal, has not been playing a prominent role. We need to understand our capacity, our relevance, and our leveraging capacities, and make the best use of it. We are an important member of the Bay of Bengal and the Indian Ocean region, and that's the way we should behave. The Bay of Bengal also has critical relevance to hinterland states which are landlocked, like Nepal, like Bhutan, like parts of India, Northeast, like the southern part of China, the Yunnan province. So those are spaces that once gateways to the Bay of Bengal, and Bangladesh should provide that gateway that can leverage our position to greater heights. Bangladesh is a unique member of both BRI as a signatory and IPS in the, in the Pacific strategy as a, as a member that believes in its principles. So we must play an important role in sort of bridging the two concepts in the, into the Bay, which is non-military in nature. I would say that we are a critically affected country by climate change. So therefore, the climate change impacts on the Bay of Bengal and Indian Ocean should be a high agenda on our total national policies. We should also work closely on restoring the marine ecology of the Bay of Bengal. As I said in the beginning, the, the maritime space does not have a security architecture. Therefore, we might take some initiatives in proposing security architectures 
that are acceptable to the members of the Bay of Bengal and the Indian Ocean littoral countries. There are several track to initiatives currently on about the Indian Ocean. Some have graduated to track one, like IONS. There is a goal dialogue process. Bangladesh is absent in proposing any process. So Bangladesh should take the initiative in proposing an active track to process for the Bay of Bengal and the Indian Ocean region. Although Bangladesh has demarcated its maritime boundary, we've got our own easels and continental shelf, but they have been grossly underutilized. It is time for us to have a comprehensive policy how to utilize those maritime spaces. And last but not the least, the Indian Ocean region and the Bay of Bengal is a very vulnerable country in terms of non-traditional security challenges, including climate change, Bangladesh is in the forefront. So therefore, Bangladesh can take an initiative, even through the IORA, of which we chair now, to craft out a non-traditional security strategy for the maritime space of the Bay of Bengal and the Indian Ocean. And overall, Bangladesh should also work in proposing what is being called a Bay of Bengal community, which encompasses many of the issues that you are talking. It is an important maritime space of which we are a member. We have to play our very vital role and leverage our importance in all international relations. I would like, also like to leave by a historical anecdote before I finish. Lord Wavell, when handing over the charge to Lord Mountbatten said, a very important advice for him that look after the defense of the Indian Ocean, in particular, pay special attention to the Bay of Bengal. So that is the kind of focus that we all need. I thank you all for being with us this afternoon. Please come and attend our round table stand next month for more interesting discussions and insights. Thank you all very much. Thank you.